This talk will focus upon child sexual abuse perpetrators, specifically those who have a relationship with children in a family setting. It could be a parent or a step-parent, might also be a relative, a neighbor, a babysitter, or somebody who has a close relationship with a child developed within the context, usually, of their family relationships. Most of the material that I'm presenting here come from the Barnett and the Cross and Tower resources that I mentioned earlier in the semester in one of my talks. Sexual perpetration doesn't just happen. There really are a number of factors that need to come together for the perpetrator to be able to carry off his intentions. And here are some of the things that David Finkelhor, who is a researcher in this area, describe as preconditions for sexual perpetration. There are four different preconditions mentioned here. One is the motivation to abuse. First of all, the perpetrator has to have a need that the child fulfills and have some emotional comfort with the behavior itself, so this emotional congruence. Sexual arousal through whatever dynamic operates in the perpetrator to become aroused during a sex act with a child. And then also a blockage of normal outlets for sexual and emotional needs. Usually this is based on a fear or some sort of social problem. And because of those reservations, the perpetrator turns to children to fulfill their sexual and emotional needs. Finkelhor would maintain that if these conditions don't exist, then it is unlikely that sexual perpetration would occur. Next, the perpetrator has to have the means of overcoming internal inhibitors. If there is any kind of reluctance, there must be something to help overcome those inhibitors. And this might include alcohol or impulse control disorder of some type, perhaps disordered family dynamics that normalized behaviors between adults and children. All of these might contribute to block the normal inner voice that prohibits most adults from engaging in such behavior. An expert in Alaska actually maintained that all sexual offenders have an antisocial personality disorder, which, among other things, implies that they lack empathy or the ability to relate to what a victim might be going through during the act. They must also have the means of overcoming external inhibitors. They need to have privacy or a lack of boundaries between the adults and the children in the situation. Poor child supervision would be one way of overcoming external inhibitors the child who is socially isolated, and those kinds of things. Then, of course, must have access to the victim. And oftentimes, this is through youth organizations or church organizations. Although, as I mentioned earlier, members of the family or close friends nearby or whatever may also have access to the children because of their relationships with the child and the child's family. Finally, a means of overcoming the child's resistance because children know on a certain level that this is not okay. And so the perpetrator has to work to overcome that resistance. This will occur sometimes more easily with children who have very poor self-concept, who have low self-protection skills. And what they will do is develop a close relationship with the child and work to normalize the sexual conduct through grooming, which I'll talk about in a few moments. And all of these kinds of things really open the door for the abuse to occur. So these four conditions have to exist before sexual abuse of a minor would occur. Usually, child sexual abuse involves nonviolent behaviors. Long-lasting physical injuries from these episodes are rare. Physical violence accompanies about 20% of these incidents, but threats of physical harm are much more frequent. And here you see a listing of the types of abuse by, and I hesitate to use the term severity, but by severity, moving from sexual touching and voyeurism to intercourse. And you see that a large percentage of these situations progress to much more serious sexual interactions with children. Perpetrators will usually select vulnerable or at-risk children for sexual abuse. Some of them will use fear, threats, force, and subterfuge for their interactions with children that they do know. But uh, sometimes perpetrators might be seen hanging out in parks where children play. I once heard a perpetrator describe how he would select his victims. He would hang out in a mall and observe groups of children that were there. Uh, these would probably be young adolescents. And he believed that he could select the most vulnerable and the most likely candidate just by watching interactions of the children and and he would select the kids that tended to hang on the outside of the group rather than be the center of all the attention, knowing that that child is probably hungry for acceptance and interactions. 
Grooming behavior I referred to earlier is the premeditated behavior that's intended to manipulate the potential victim into complying with the sexual abuse. First of all, the perpetrator would work to separate the child from protective adults so that this kind of behavior can can occur and will gradually introduce the topic of sex and touching through his interactions. And I say his, sometimes there are female perpetrators, but generally we're talking about males here, through his interactions with the child. So he may first begin with exposing the child to sexual content through such things as pornography, videos, movies, those kinds of things. He may begin to touch the child first in non-sexual ways and then moving towards more sexualized kinds of touching, normalizing the contact very gradually begins a process of seductions and oftentimes enticements with promises of candy and toys and video games and all those kinds of things, gifts to the child, and then also may use verbal and physical intimidation. Although, again, generally in molestations, you don't find this kind of um, physical threats and force in these situations. What will happen a lot of times is because the child is seduced, the perpetrator is very adept at convincing the child that the child is a full participant in behaviors. And so the child is instilled with a lot of guilt and fear of the parents finding out. And in fact, The perpetrator knows this and can use this to solicit more sexual interactions with the child later. In this day and age, you have online molesters, and they use much the same tactics, but it's really over the computer. With the introduction of webcams into computers some years ago, this really increased the likelihood of online sexual perpetration. And of course, smartphones now are ubiquitous and children have them and can be enticed oftentimes into sending photographs or accepting sexual content photographs back and forth. If the perpetrator engages the child in pornography, he can create a market for child victims and this becomes a tool for the perpetrators to stimulate victims and to blackmail the victims as well. Prostitution, oftentimes the adults started as children and were, were had been sexually victimized and come to see their value as being through their sexuality and what they can offer others with their sexual selves. Runaway and throwaway youth are particularly vulnerable in this area. It's one of the reasons why shelters for runaway youth are so very vital to get the kids off the street so that they don't need to market themselves in order to live. There are both short-term and long-term effects of sexual abuse, and here are some of the suggestions of the range of behavioral and emotional changes that you'll see. Sexualized behavior being one of the most common effects of child sexual abuse, but also PTSD and psychopathological and emotional effects and somatic complaints from the children. And long-term sets up a lot of depression, anxiety, anger, and mistrust, and oftentimes fear of intimacy, particularly if the perpetrator is someone who is close to the family or close to the child and is in a position of trust. There can be uh, sexual adjustment issues, either phobias about sexuality and anxiety or promiscuity, behavior dysfunctions, and PTSD effects long into their adulthood. There are different factors that affect the level of trauma that are experienced by victims, although this shouldn't be taken as gospel because it really depends on a lot of different things. But here are some of the factors that might determine the level of trauma experienced by victims. One is the duration of the abuse. Is it something that happened once or is it something that's gone on over a longer period of time? Has the child been victimized in other ways? As we've mentioned earlier in the semester, victims who have experienced abuse in many different forms, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, oftentimes will have a greater experience of trauma with abuse. The extent and type of the abuse, is it sadistic? Is it violent? How far did the abuse progress? Looking at that list that we had mentioned a few slides back. At what age did the abuse occur? There are different developmental issues that arise depending upon how old the child is. Young boys who are victims of sexual abuse misunderstand what happened and sometimes worry that it turns them into a girl. Of course, older children are more aware of the implications if you have a boy being molested by a male in regards to homosexuality and That's another discouragement for reporting these things. And children are often confused. Boys in particular are confused because of the fact that they experience sexual arousal during these episodes and don't understand necessarily that it's a physiological response, not an indication that they are participating or enjoy the abuse.
Of course, all the positive feelings that come with sexual behavior also is another thing that can cause a lot of confusion among both boys and girls. The identity of the perpetrator and the relationship with the victim. And again, if this is someone who's in a role as a parent or a trusted adult, then the impact of the abuse, the trauma created by the abuse may be greater for the child because of that and impinge upon their ability to have trusting relationships with other people later in life. Was the abuse disclosed in adulthood or childhood also has an impact on the kind of trauma that the child experiences because people will react differently depending upon the age of the victim. And oftentimes for children, people don't believe the children, even though children almost never lie about sexual abuse. This is something that we've been taught, and I believe that when children describe sexual abuse occurring to them, it's very rare that they're lying. And older children sometimes may have some secondary motivations for reporting that may or may not indicate that the abuse did or did not occur. But with younger children in particular, you don't really have younger children lying about sexual abuse. As an adult, oftentimes accounts of abuse are discounted because of the concerns about recovered memories and false memories and those kinds of things as well. So when the community or the trusted individuals around that person don't accept the allegations, that's only going to increase the trauma. And the reactions by those significant others to the disclosure of abuse can have a great bearing upon how traumatic this winds up being for them. And then just more generally, the personality structure of the victim is another thing that determines the level of trauma experienced by victims. So you can see there's a number of factors that interact here. And again, I don't want to say that sexual molestation isn't traumatic in any of its forms, but we're talking about a matter of degree, I think, here. So different risk factors are associated with child sexual abuse. For instance, the characteristics of the child, does the child have a cognitive disability? Is the child depressed? Does he have an unhappy appearance? This is something that attracts perpetrators to the child. As for the perpetrator, being a male in, is one of the risk factors for since most child sexual abuse perpetrators are male. Poor impulse control, a history of victimization, antisocial personality disorder, sexual insecurities, in the child's family, single parents with live-in partners seem to be a situation where child sexual abuse occurs more frequently. Low education of the parents, history of victimization, sexual victimization in particular, isolation of the family, poor supervision of the children. These all contribute to higher risk for child sexual abuse. In the community and the culture, over-sexualization, the domination of males in our culture, lack of empathy in males, the overall permission, so to speak, for adult child sexual contact, which does exist in some cultures and some communities. So should we focus on the victim? There's very little evidence that supports looking to the victim, encouraging or allowing abuse. And this is something particularly with adolescent female victims that the male perpetrator will often say that she seduced him and that she encouraged the sexual interaction. Oftentimes what you're looking at is the effects of the abuse rather than the causes of the abuse. We don't really believe that children prompt sexual abuse. They're developmentally incapable of giving consent. So we want to focus on the offender for understanding child sexual abuse. And there's a number of different points here just to mention. Deviant sexual arousal and pedophilia. Here's an interesting thing. First of all, we're going to talk about it in a second that not all sexual molesters are pedophiles. It's an interesting thing here that one study showed that almost a quarter of male undergraduate students that were in this study reported sexual attraction to children. When that number of people, that number of males report this, is it a deviant behavior? I think we would all agree that it is, but there is an argument from a sociological standpoint, let's say, that it's something less than totally deviant. Plethysmography which measures arousal clinically, can also help to define and identify the level of sexual arousal of the perpetrator. This essentially involves hooking electrical sensors to the perpetrator's penis and exposing the perpetrator to various photographs of sexual interactions with adults and children and seeing their level of arousal. This is an interesting tool, by the way, in the treatment of sexual offenders that can help to identify who the perpetrator is most sexually attracted to and can help identify who are most at risk with the individual perpetrator. Sexual offenders tend to have cognitive distortions that functions 
as the disinhibitors for child sexual abuse. They tell themselves all sorts of things to provide permission for their behavior, like sex with children is harmless. Children can provoke adults into sex. I'm just teaching her about sex in a kind way. I'd rather have her learn it from me than from some boy who's going to use her in the community. As far as childhood history of sexual abuse is concerned, offenders are more likely to have been sexually abused as a child than others. This doesn't mean that if a child is molested, they're going to turn out to be a perpetrator. So don't get it backwards, but it is more frequent that perpetrators have been molested as a child. Having experienced or observed victimization, the offender has learned that children can be used for sexual gratification or as a form of anxiety reduction, according to some experts. Distinctions exist between child sexual abuse perpetrators, molesters, and the rapists. And this uh, discussion really doesn't have the time to go into the dynamics behind rapists, but generally that act involves power and control and is less about sex and more about power and control assertion. That's for another talk, and we're not going to go into that here. We'll talk more about the dynamics involving sexual abuse perpetrators and molesters. So do we focus on the family? Is child sexual abuse an outcome of family dynamics? Sadly, it does seem that we tend to blame mothers for most every problem that children have, if you haven't noticed that. And mothers once were blamed for child sexual abuse because they weren't satisfying their husbands or their partners sexually, and so the males had no alternative but to turn to children. This has never been supported by research and should be discounted. A contemporary view sees the mother more as a victim herself, and oftentimes she has a history of child sexual abuse as well. We've talked about that earlier in the semester. It's something that's very important to address if you're working with a family with child sexual abuse and you find the mother is an adult molested as a child. Families of child sexual abuse victims in general are frequently disorganized, lack cohesion, and are generally more dysfunctional than most other families. What about society and culture? Culture that has gender inequality, male dominance, patriarchy, saturation of sexuality and violence in the media, and the sexualization of children in the media. If you look at advertisements, oftentimes models become younger and younger, and companies such as Calvin Klein have been criticized for using very young models and trying to sell their products using sex as the come on. That, I notice, seems to be less frequent than in the past, but there's an infusion of sexuality in our media that has an influence upon this as well. And then there's all sorts of integrative theories that explain child sexual abuse that combines the biological, the social, sociological, and personal attachment explanations connecting to early development in the offender's life and the stressful events in the offender's life that weren't resolved successfully. And the young person began to rely upon sexual thoughts and sexual behaviors in order to cope with the stress in their life. And then other factors being present like access to victims and those disinhibitors that we talked about earlier allows the offender to be predisposed to engage in sexually abusive behaviors. In explaining child sexual abuse, we're looking at this from a larger perspective, a social scientist's view of the behavior of the problem. But when we get right down to it and who is accountable, we have to, of course, hold the perpetrator accountable for these behaviors. Nicholas Groth did an extensive study of sexual offenders and identified that not all sexual offenders were pedophiles. Now, his study involved individuals who were, first of all, they were imprisoned, which means that they were caught, they were convicted, and they've acknowledged their offense. And we know that there are a lot of sexual offenders out there who aren't caught. And if they are caught, they don't acknowledge it, they aren't imprisoned, and so on. And so this is a rather specialized population population of sex offenders. And so understanding his typology, I think you have to keep that in mind that this may not apply to all offenders, but it is something that has given people who are treating offenders something to hold on to, at least, as far as how to approach each person. And he essentially divided sexual abuse offenders, molesters, into two different groups, the regressed offender and the fixated offender. Now, the regressed offender is usually attracted to females, so these would not be, usually would not be perpetrators who are molesting boys. Usually attracted to females, and although they're engaged in sexual behavior with children, their primary source of sexual attraction are adults. 
but they feel inadequate. And oftentimes this inadequacy is exacerbated by crises or trauma and stresses in their lives. And in order to deal with this trauma and the stress, they begin to sexualize their relationships with younger children because they can't turn to their other adults because they feel very inadequate with other persons their own age. So they see themselves as younger perhaps, or they attribute adult characteristics to the child and by doing this then excuse their behaviors. A fixated offender is sexually attracted to children, and fixated offenders are predominantly attracted to male children. This arises from an early developmental stage, some issues that occurred early in their development, and there are just many, many issues that have not been resolved in their lives. And so you can see the fixated offender is really focused on children as sexual objects and the object of their desire, whereas a regressed offender tends to be more focused upon adults, but turns to children because they don't feel secure with adults. I once worked with a young man, I think he was around 19 years of age, and was a handsome young man who was arrested for uh, sexual interactions with a 12-year-old girl. He met at a party. She was uh, not, not being supervised properly. She shouldn't have been at that party, of course. Just tying back to some of the situations that explain how these things occur, she was quite attracted to him, and he felt she was coming on to him. He told me that she didn't look like she was just 12, meaning that she was developmentally attractive to him. And in his own mind, he was raising her up to be in his brain, somebody more his own age. And as I worked with him over a period of time, he told me that it was easier for him to engage in sex with this girl because he knew that anything he did, she wouldn't judge him negatively. She would accept him. She would be pleased with what he did, whereas he didn't feel that same way with women of his own age. And so you see, there's a, a good example of the dynamics I was talking about with aggressive behavior. Now, Groth believed that both the fixated and regressed offenders share characteristics. They all have feelings of isolation. They tend to lack consistent intimate attachments. They experience feelings of fear and emptiness and depression. They tend to have rather submissive personalities. And oftentimes fantasy will replace active searching for sexual interactions. And they see themselves as a victim of external forces and usually lack empathy. Again, that, that absence of empathy is one of those preconditions that almost certainly has to be there for an adult to use a child for sexual gratification. Adult relationships for these, for these guys, just too difficult. So sexual offending is best understood utilizing the abuse cycle that is not unlike the addiction cycle. The relapse prevention model is the one that I think is still used mostly as the centerpiece of treatment with sex offenders. And there's a lot of uh, cognitive behavioral interventions also in that to challenge their distorted thinking about, about children and about women and about themselves. Treatment is long term. There are those who believe that treatment can be successful not in curing sexual offending, but in teaching the sexual offender about his relapse cycle, about his abuse cycle, and teaching him what his high-risk situations are and how to deal with those situations and how to avoid them. That if the offender can get a hold of those situations and not allow himself to be exposed to those high-risk situations, then he's more likely to be successful in not offending again. This is not unlike the substance abuse treatment approach as well. Treatment has to be personalized to meet the needs of the client. And the professional, meanwhile, has various issues to deal with as well. First of all, uh, feelings of countertransference, either feeling very protective of the victim of the offender with whom he's working, and also some anger at the perpetrator. I've seen that with a lot of professionals that have worked side by side with who work with sex offenders. Also, the victim engages in sexualized behaviors and sometimes in the presence of the professional, as well as the perpetrator. That sometimes the perpetrator will, in treatment, will sexualize, fantasy-wise, sexualize the relationship with the, the professional as well. And so it's something that emerges eventually in, in your work with him and, and gives you a lot of grounds for, uh, fertile ground for treatment. The process of working with victims and offenders oftentimes going to, if you have victimization issues yourself, you're going to be recalling those, those episodes. Those are things that you'll want to be aware of and have a grip on. And of course, also the whole issue about vic vicarious traumatization. Our worldview changes as we begin to deal with these kinds of problems that 
other people just don't even want to acknowledge exist. Not all survivors need treatment, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. But for those that do, early intervention is needed as much as possible. What happens a lot of times in the treatment of sexual abuse victims is they'll plateau. You know, they'll work on issues for a while, and then it seems as though they've done everything they can do, and it's just time to call a break to treatment. But later on, they may come back again. And, and uh, with children in particular, you know, you may find that you work with them, uh, young children in particular, you work with them early on after the victimization and you get to that plateau. And then perhaps later, maybe at puberty, maybe before some other event occurs, but at puberty, as the victim begins to experience sexual feelings, it's time to start working on issues again as new things come up and then resolve those issues. And perhaps later on when the a young person begins to establish intimacy and in relationships, all those kinds of things, you get the idea that developmentally, there may be times when the victim will need to come back into treatment to work through issues as their ability to understand things change. Later life events might also prompt a need for treatment as well. As far as the perpetrators are concerned, you're going to find that there tends to be a lot of vindictiveness in thinking about perpetrators, but it's important to keep in mind that if the problem of child sexual abuse and sexual assault in general is ever going to be resolved, we have to work with perpetrators and help them to change as well. The goal of treatment is not to cure sexual offending, but is to reduce the likelihood of relapse or recidivism. There are all different sorts of approaches to treating offenders that are mentioned here, medical approaches, uh, I'm not sure uh, just how effective they are, but there are something that's, that's used. Insight therapies, uh, CBT, and those kinds of things. Group interventions, family systems approaches, and cognitive behavioral techniques, a relapse prevention model. There is some data that supports the effectiveness of treatment for less severe offenders, but the more severe offenders don't show the same level of success in treatment. And, and certainly there is a need to continue to improve interventions with offenders. There's a demand by the public to control the offenders, and we're not going to be able to just put them in prison and throw away the key. They're going to come out of prison if they do go to prison at all, if they're even caught. For those that are, there are such things as the sex offender registries, which document the location of offenders. All the states now, and in fact, I believe now it's much easier to be able to check from one state to the next. And there are legislative efforts in response to this public pressure that really tend to be based on public concerns and not necessarily on good research findings. And so research doesn't drive the uh, interventions we're using as much as it is just pressure from, from voters. There are a number of different legislative maneuvers, let's say, that have occurred as a result of various tragedies involving children over the years. Megan's Law is one, and another is the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006. And you can see here that this involved integrating state sex offender registries, mandatory sentencing for crimes against children, and so on. If you're not familiar, Adam Walsh was a five or six-year-old boy who disappeared in South Florida in the early 1980s. It got a lot of attention. I was in Florida, Central Florida at the time that uh, he disappeared, and I can remember there were flyers posted all over Orlando with his photograph, and, and it turned up his, his severed head was found in a drainage ditch not far from where he disappeared in South Florida. They never convicted the man who actually, he confessed to this, but then recanted later on because there wasn't enough evidence. But the authorities are satisfied that he was the person who committed the crime. Adam's father has become very famous, John Walsh, who's been on television a lot with various programs hunting down offenders and, and criminals. From a case management perspective, there are all sorts of considerations. If child sexual abuse occurs with the perpetrator in the home or who has access to the home, of course, one of the considerations is, can you guarantee that the offender would not have further contact with the child? And sometimes that isn't as simple as it may seem. It's oftentimes, remember again, the non-offending parent may have her own issues regarding victimization and may not be able to stand up to the offender and sometimes the non-offending parent has a harder time protecting children from re-exposure to the perpetrator than you might believe. And so an issue that comes up is, can we maintain the child in their home safely or does the child need to be removed? Is there a way to remove the perpetrator and guarantee that the perpetrator doesn't have contact? And of course, that's the preferred alternative isn't to remove the child, it's to remove the perpetrator in all of our situations, actually. But 
perpetrators tend to be very persistent. Are the courts involved? More and more, we have referrals for young children who are engaging in sexual acts with even younger children. Undoubtedly, they've been victimized themselves, most likely at least. And do you involve the juvenile courts in those kinds of cases, or do you lean towards treatment? Adolescent offenders, of course, is another area. And what kind of treatment should be utilized? Child sexual abuse victims, interventions with them as far as interviewing has really kind of developed quite of an art now. It kind of grows out of the sexual assault response team or SART model. Uh, Child advocacy centers tend to be the sort of the kitty SARTs more or less, and it involves a child-friendly setting and interviewing done by a trained professional in, and it's very specific training. And if you're interested in this, I encourage you to find it and to get it. I know OCS was doing this training. I don't know if they still are or not. For years they were doing this. In fact, I was one of the trainers for a period of time. There are very specific things that you need to know when you're interviewing little children. And so to do an interview that's going to stand up in court forensically, trained professionals doing the interviews, multidisciplinary team, and everybody else sits behind a one-way mirror and observes the interview so that the child doesn't have to be interviewed over and over and over again. This says that 66% of the cases of uh, sexual abuse perpetrators are taken to court. I think that is a gross exaggeration. I think it's maybe 66% of the cases of those who are arrested for child sexual abuse, but even still that says a third of them don't make it to court. Only half of those reach a verdict. And again, I will tell you that we we know there are many more sexual offenders out there than we ever become aware of. And so it talks about plea bargaining here. I mean, it just tells you that this is a very difficult, very difficult situation to settle. Of note, by the way, I just mentioned that child protection statutes, well, first of all, the criminal statutes, if a perpetrator, say a father or stepfather is arrested and is charged with sexual offense, in the end, the evidence that's required in order to convict them criminally is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That's like close to 85%, I think, certain something along that line. And sometimes the only witness is the child who, as we mentioned earlier, isn't always believed or who recants or who is too intimidated, too frightened to testify. This is one of the things that where the CAC interviews sometimes can help a great deal. So it's difficult to criminally convict sex offenders sometimes, but the child protection process doesn't need beyond a shadow of a doubt a legal justification for removal of a child. The child protection really to remove only needs probable cause, which is a very small, like 33% proof. But in order to maintain a child away from the family, child protection units only need a preponderance of the evidence, more than 50% in order to have the child adjudicated, a child in need of aid, and to be able to maintain custody of the child if there's a situation where the perpetrator continues to have access to the home. So CPS sometimes is in a better position to protect the child than the legal system offers as far as criminal convictions are concerned. Not saying that's the preferred outcome, but it is something just to keep in mind. Education programs for kids, the school-based empowerment programs, there has not been a demonstrated relationship with the decline in numbers of victims. There are some criticisms about these because these tend to put responsibility for prevention on the child victim. You know, the, the whole thing about saying no and using a big voice and those kinds of things. Also, these programs are thought to give a false sense of security to parents because kids are developmentally, they're not ready to protect themselves all the time. Some kids are better than others, but but we shouldn't rely upon the child to protect himself or herself. And so the parental role in child education means that this is probably the more effective approach is to give specific instructions about how to talk to children about sexual abuse. Parents need to learn behaviors associated with child sexual abuse so that they recognize signs and symptoms if this occurring. They need to respond to those signs appropriately to reduce the isolation and anger and self-blame, and also to ensure that, as I've mentioned several times during the semester, ensure that the parents' own victimization issues, if they do exist, have been resolved. Because it's going to be very, very difficult for the non-offending parent to respond to those signs and symptoms when they're closing themselves off psychologically from their own signs and symptoms.
Okay, that's all I have on this topic. I hope that you found some useful information here. And if there are questions about this, you know, let me know. We'll find some time in class to talk it over. Thank you.